fortunate to have Dr. Terry Greiling as our first presenter. Dr. Greiling is an assistant professor of dermatology and an associate program director of research in dermatology at the Oregon Health and Sciences University School of Medicine in Portland, Oregon. Dr. Greiling has a special interest in autoimmunity, including lupus and scleroderma. After her dermatology residency at Yale, she went on to complete a postdoctoral research fellowship studying how the microbiome affects individuals with autoimmune diseases, particularly lupus. She also provides dermatologic care at the Center for Health and Healing and at the Center for Women's Health at OHSU. Dr. Greiling will now talk about cutaneous lupus and how it affects the skin. So when you say lupus to most doctors, they think of systemic lupus and all the organs that lupus can manifest in. Um, and I'll be using abbreviation SLE for, uh, for systemic lupus. But when you say lupus to a dermatologist, we actually think of a few very separate diseases that I want to start by talking about. So there's acute cutaneous lupus erythematosus, which is a, a shorter term situation where the, the rash comes on with flares of systemic lupus and then fades away again when the disease is under better control. There's subacute cutaneous lupus, which tends to be more long lasting, sometimes comes with symptoms of systemic lupus and sometimes just the rash comes alone. There's chronic cutaneous lupus, which are the skin manifestations that tend to come on, stay for a very long time, and be scarring. And these can either happen with systemic lupus or they can happen by themselves. And then there's neonatal lupus, which happens, again, the skin manifestations then happen independently. So starting with acute cutaneous lupus, thinking about that, so 100% of these patients have systemic lupus manifestations. The classic way to think about that one is the butterfly rash that's very famous in lupus. As I mentioned, it comes and goes with flares. So if people's butterfly rash is flaring, generally they feel terrible overall and everything's flaring together. It's a tricky rash, the malar rash of lupus, that it, it tends to be a little bit nonspecific. And so these pictures are examples where I say all of these women have some fatigue and joint pain and a positive anti-nuclear antibody blood test. But who has lupus? And just by looking at the photos, you can't always tell. So these top two patients are patients with systemic lupus. Here's an example. Uh, two examples of rosacea that can look very much like lupus, an example of allergic contact dermatitis, and dermatomyositis, which is a different autoimmune disease. And so it's tricky for doctors and patients alike that when you have a red face, you know, does that always mean lupus? And just as another example, this is one of my patients with systemic lupus, but she actually has rosacea too. And so the, the rash on her skin was, was sort of staying all the time, even when her lupus was in better control. I gave her a cream for rosacea and she got better, but then she had another strange rash on her foot and that turned out to be a manifestation of her chronic cutaneous or discoid lupus and that didn't look classic for that. Um, so you don't, often don't know exactly what you're looking at, but sometimes a skin biopsy can help. Next, thinking about hair loss and lupus. So I put hair loss and lupus in three different categories. The first one is just called lupus hair and that's people with systemic lupus tend to get thinning and breakage of their hair, especially around the frontal hairline. It's a little bit irregular, but again, that's non-scarring, meaning it's reversible, that when uh, the disease calms down, the hair can grow back. That's quite similar to a condition called telogen effluvium that you can see both in patients with lupus and with any other disease, but that is when your body is under a lot of stress, either medical stress when you're ill or even psychological stress, um, like a death in the family or a new job, it shocks all your hair into this resting phase, and then two to three months later, it sheds out in large amounts. It can feel like all the hair is falling out. But again, that is, is not scarring. It is reversible. When everything calms down, the hair will grow back from the root. And that's in contrast to, to discoid lupus of the scalp. And so that's part of the chronic cutaneous lupus. When you get these lesions on the scalp, they're very deep, the amount of inflammation that goes all the way down to the root of the hair and attacks so um, exuberantly that the hair falls out and will not grow back. Other signs of systemic lupus um, that can be 
subtle or not always subtle, but nail beds can be red. The palms, the entire palm can turn bright red. The cuticles especially can turn bright red. We see spots on the ears sometimes. The discoid lupus can be inside the ears. People can get ulcers in their mouth when their systemic lupus is flaring. And then often very sun sensitive rashes. And so they can look again, very nonspecific, can mimic other common diseases like eczema or contact dermatitis, but a skin biopsy can often tell the difference between those different things. And then even vasculitis um, in patients with lupus. Moving on to subacute cutaneous lupus. So about 15% of these patients will meet criteria for systemic lupus, but the rest will not. It's a very characteristic rash that happens on the chest and back in this sort of V-shaped distribution. And fortunately, it is not scarring that when it is under better control, um, will go away. So as I mentioned, chest and back can be kind of on the neck and upper arms, very sun sensitive, and these patients often make anti-rho antibodies in their bloodstream. There are two varieties. One looks very circular that can mimic, say, a, a ringworm or a fungal infection on the skin. Another variant that looks very much like psoriasis. Again, patients often have some tiredness and joint pain when these rashes are flaring, but usually have a milder course of systemic symptoms. And then chronic cutaneous lupus. So when, when people come in and this is the first sign of lupus on their skin is these discoid les lupus lesions that very few of them at that time have systemic lupus, only about 5%. Although if you then watch over many, many years, so say up to 20 years, maybe 15 or 20% of them will develop lupus over time. So many of them still don't, but it, it is something that we watch for. So these spots on the skin come up, um, they last a long time and they're quite scarring. They again happen in most commonly in sun exposed areas. So the, the top of the head, the face, the ears, um, they often have this very dark edge with a lighter or white center, some thick scale on them. And then when they happen on the scalp, then the hair will fall out over it. So discoid lupus is the most common type of chronic cutaneous lupus, but there are some other subtypes too. So here's a photo showing lupus paniculitis, which means the inflammation is so deep it goes into the, the subcutaneous fat layer of the skin too. Bullous lupus is the next one at the top. So it's the, where the inflammation is so intense, you actually get blistering at the same time. Tumid lupus is a type where you get these sort of deeper, again, thicker plaques often on the face and then chilblains lupus. And so chilblains is a disease that you read about a lot in ancient Victorian novels, where when people are very cold and in damp conditions, anyone can develop these sort of painful red or reddish purple bumps uh, on their fingers or toes. But people who have lupus develop them very easily um, when they're not in those same uh, damp and cold conditions. And it's an interesting part that's actually been in the news lately uh, in our current pandemic situation that people with COVID-19 can actually also develop chilblains that look very similar to lupus. And even uh, I'm seeing in some of my patients with lupus getting very severe chilblains when they get COVID infections. Um, and finally, neonatal lupus. So neonatal lupus is a condition in which the mother has anti rho antibodies, and those antibodies then cross the placenta into the baby during development. And so the baby um, itself does not have lupus, but these antibodies are in circulation, and so they can create some problems that are similar to lupus. The worrisome manifestation is that babies can actually have heart problems, and that's less than 2% of babies born to moms with anti rho antibodies will have heart block. But about 16% will develop this very sun sensitive rash on often on the face that looks like subacute cutaneous lupus. Now, since those antibodies over months get cleared from baby circulation and baby doesn't make the antibodies, then that all goes away over the first about six months of life and the baby will be fine, but can have a little bit of scarring from the skin lesions. So those are the types of lupus as I think about them. And now I wanna go into talking about caring for lupus skin. And so um, for, for my patients who come see me in clinic, uh, you get a lot of lectures about sun protection. And so starting from that, when I think about, a lot of people are told, well, lupus is a sun sensitive disease and so you have to avoid the sun. But that's not really said in an accurate way because it's not just sun, it's all ultraviolet light. So if we think about wavelengths of light, the ultraviolet spectrum is then even broken down into categories. So 
ultraviolet C light is filtered out by the ozone layer. So as long as you live in a place in the world with an intact ozone layer, we don't have to worry about that. UVB comes through on bright sunny days, but it's actually filtered by clouds. So on a cloudy day, you don't get any UVB light. And that's the type of UV light that causes sunburn and causes skin cancer um, with lots of exposure. Whereas UVA light um, then can be further broken down. UVA2 is actually not filtered by clouds, comes all the way through, but is filtered by window glass. And this is the type of light that really contributes to wrinkles and skin aging and also contributes to skin cancer over time. And only UVA1 comes all the way through window glass as well and we know contributes to aging. But all of these types of UV light can help flare lupus skin. It's not just UVB on a sunny day. And to mention too, um, indoor tanning beds are another things that give dermatologists the chills and are like fingernails on a blackboard. So um, they use only UVA light, which is why they used to claim that they didn't cause skin cancer, but they actually use UVA light at 15 times the normal doses that you'd get in the brightest sunny day. So we definitely know that dramatically increases the skin cancer risk and we see skin cancer or even in teenagers from too much tanning bed use. And just to take it another step further to, to not to make you too paranoid, but the compact fluorescent light bulbs that have that spiral appearance, the, the light actually would emit UV, but then is, is coated on the inside of the light bulb with a filter to protect the UV light from coming out and just emit visible light. But I, I saw one little study where they just went and bought a bunch of light bulbs from the hardware store and tested them. And unfortunately you can get little chinks in the manufacturing process so that the coating isn't perfect. And so some of the, these light bulbs often do emit some UV light. Now it's a small amount. And so they did a test where they had people sit um, very close to the light bulb. So say it was at a desk lamp and you're, you're working at your desk or reading for a few hours. And so people um, without sun sensitive conditions um, had to sit there for something like six hours before they could actually get some sunburn from that light. But patients with lupus, it only took 30 minutes minutes till their skin started to react. Um, so it's important to be kind of aware of all the different sources of UV, UV light around you. So at least two thirds of people with lupus are UV sensitive. And the interesting thing is it can not only flare skin rashes, but that inflammation can then cascade on to, to flare all the internal manifestations of the disease as well. So there are these sort of horrible case reports of people going to the beach and getting a sunburn and then ending up in the hospital after that with, with kidney damage. And that process isn't immediate. So it's not always obvious that you go out and then you immediately feel sick that same day. It's something that can even take, even for the skin reaction, can even even take a week or two as a delayed reaction. So if you wake up one day and you're feeling extra achy and tired, you don't always connect that to walking your dog in the park a, a week ago. But it is important to be sort of vigilant all the time at protecting your skin from UV light. So how do you do that? Of course, sunscreen is a good way to start. You know, the first question I usually get, well, what SPF do I need to use? And so if you think about how SPF is calculated, you actually take 100 divided by the number. So as an example, SPF 100, 100 divided by 100 is one, only 1% 1 of the light can get through that sunscreen. So 99% is filtered out. SPF 50 means 2% of the light gets through. So you're 98% protected. And down to SPF 25, still only 4% of the UVB light gets through. So you're 96% protected. So really most sunscreen is doing a good job um, at helping protect your skin from the sun. Now that number is only calculated by UVB light, not UVA. And so it, the sunscreen has to say broad spectrum and that means it's protecting you from UVA as well. Now the caution is that the, the number of SPF calculated on the bottle is made using a pretty thick layer on the skin. And most people don't use that much sunscreen as much as recommended. They use a much thinner layer. And so you can really make up for that by just jumping to a high SPF. So really it shouldn't matter anything over 25 to 30, but in, in real life use, or if you're gonna be out in bright sunlight at the beach, the higher the better. And I actually still do reach for SPF 100 if I'm gonna be uh, in a really intense sunny exposure. The types of sunscreen out there are another question that I get a lot. So I put it into two broad categories. There's chemical sunscreen and physical sunscreen. So chemical sunscreen ingredients actually absorb the UV rays so they don't get to your skin. Examples of these are oxybenzone, avobenzone, octosalate, octocrylene. They tend to be much more cosmetically appealing. So I mean, they, they form a lotion that rubs on very 
smoothly onto skin, it doesn't look chalky or white, and stays on for a long time. And that's in contrast to physical sunscreen. So physical sunscreens are literally just a layer of zinc or titanium, which are metals, um, that you put on your skin and they just block the UV rays from getting through. And so they tend to be thicker and leave that kind of chalky white paste on skin, but they're very great for sensitive skin. So most of the baby sunscreens have physical blockers of zinc and titanium. And so anyone with sensitive skin, which a lot of people with lupus has, it's a great solution. And then the other question that's been in the news a lot lately is that, well, does sunscreen cause cancer? And so I would, my first answer is, well, we certainly know the sun causes cancer, um, and we don't really know about sunscreen. So there was an article that came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association this past year. There was a lot of news hype about it. And so it's good to look at what the study actually did. So they took 24 people. They had them take a four ounce bottle of sunscreen, so a medium sized bottle of sunscreen, and apply it to their entire body four times a day, so they used four bottles of sunscreen a day and do that for four days, and they collect 30 blood samples over those four days, and they look to detect, see if they could detect levels of the sunscreen in their blood. And so I guess not surprisingly, yes, if you use that much sunscreen, you can detect these tiny microscopic amounts of sunscreen in your bloodstream. So the highest was for oxybenzone, which is at 10 parts per million was detected in the bloodstream. And so even then, does that matter? Does oxybenzone cause cancer? we don't even know about that connection. But if it makes you uncomfortable, again, using physical blockers instead of chemical sunscreens is fine. And, and we do know that oxybenzone is on the non-reef safe variety, whereas zinc and titanium are safe. The other thing I recommend a lot of is just UV protective clothing. So you don't have to use sunscreen if you're you know, using a barrier, a shirt or um, jacket that's protecting you from the sun. So even a white cotton shirt is, U the, the term is UPF, a universal protection factor instead of SPF is UPF 5. So it blocks 80% of the UV light, which is pretty good. Dark clothing with a very dense weave is the best that blocks the most sunlight. And many sports companies will write the UPF on the label so you can buy um, special clothing. And then using big broad broad brimmed hats and you know rash guards, kind of those like surfing shirts when you are going to be at the beach. So this is a photo. I mean, this is what my family looks like when we go um, to a sunny beach location. And so we're those silly people wearing long sleeves and, and long pants and, and giant hats. But I would say, you know, join our club. There's more and more people out there protecting them in that way. And so I tend to look around the, the beach or the pool and, and you can say most people that look like us are dermatologists or um, people with lupus or people who have had skin cancer. So uh, don't be afraid to, to wear those things. And then the other question I get is about vitamin D. So vitamin D is very important and it can come from the sun. And so most people with lupus are low in vitamin D and by having a low vitamin D seems to be a risk factor actually for developing lupus. So vitamin D can bind to white blood cells to decrease inflammation. So it is quite important. Getting 800 to 1000 international units is good for most people with lupus. And so if you know you could check have your levels checked by your doctor if they're low, start taking a vitamin D supplement and make sure that your levels are going up. There are some regimens that recommend just once a weekly these high doses of vitamin D versus a pill daily. It's not clear which one's better. I think getting anything is better, whichever way you can remember to take it. Some foods are naturally high in vitamin D, but it's really just sort of fatty fish like tuna and salmon. Cheese and egg yolks have a little bit. Liver is high in vitamin D, but not a lot of people are eating enough to get um, that. So a lot of people ask, should I be getting my vitamin D from the sun? But I think in modern society, when you, you know, there's no reason you can't take a vitamin D supplement, it's more important to protect your skin. So that's the end of that section. Thank you so much for your attention. Once again, that was great information, Dr. Greiling. We have some more members of our community with questions about cutaneous lupus. And actually, I'll go first. Dr. Greiling, in your experience, can acute cutaneous lupus occur in areas other than the face? Yes, um, acute cutaneous lupus, the, the malar rash is most famous and most widely known, but it can actually happen all over the body. So I've seen patients that are hospitalized that just have a head to toe rash, even that can be blistering and dramatic. So you can get rashes everywhere in the setting of acute cutaneous lupus. Dr. Greiling, can lupus cause sores or nodules, for lack of a better word, on the tongue? 
Getting sores in the mouth is uh, common in people with systemic lupus. Usually they happen on the roof of the mouth instead of on the tongue, uh, but they can occur in many places. Um, but it would be important if you get sores in your mouth to talk with your doctor because there are many other things that can cause sores in the mouth too. Uh, one common example would be the cold sore virus that likes to reactivate when your immune system is down uh, and can also happen commonly on the tongue. Dr. Greiling, how does UV light cause internal organ damage? And specifically, can it cause kidney damage in lupus nephritis? The question about UV light is, is very interesting. Um, the exact mechanism isn't perfectly known, um, but there are a few ways to think about it. So one is that when UV light comes in and damages the skin, you then get an immune response to try to repair the skin. And we know in lupus that immune responses tend to be overreactive um, and very exuberant and create the systemic inflammation. Another example actually is the, the people who make antibodies to Rho60 protein. Rho60 is a protein that actually helps protect us from cell damage that goes around and mops up um, abnormal RNA in the cell and protects the cells from dying. And so if you make antibodies against that protein and it can't function normally, then uh, cell death happens more easily. And again, you get more of an inflammatory response that can then, um, all the inflammation in the skin circulates through the body and can lead to flares of kidney disease. Thanks everyone for your great questions and a big thanks to you, Dr. Greiling, from all of us at Kaleidoscope Fighting Lupus. We appreciate you spending time with us today and for sharing your knowledge and expertise with our community. Well, thank you to Kaleidoscope Fighting Lupus for the invitation to speak today. Um, I really appreciate it and uh, I hope you learned something that can help you uh, manage your lupus on a day-to-day -day basis.